Well, we knew this week was going to be volatile, and so far it has not disappointed. We've had three major things going on. First of all, we've got the CPI numbers out, and it looks like they're at expectations for one part, but a little bit above on another section. Also, the Ethereum upgrade, uh, Shanghai and Chappelle comes out, which means that people are going to be able to unstake and sell their Ethereum. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. We'll take a look at that. And then finally, the most important uh, item of information I can share with you is the FMOC or FOMC meeting with the Fed came out. And I got to tell you, uh, the things that are lining up uh, for this time frame, it's just uncanny with this and the Bitcoin four-year cycle. So what I am talking about today is CPI numbers, first of all. They came in and states here from the website, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. In March, the consumer price index for all urban consumers increased 0.1%. Seasonally adjusted and rose 5% over the last 12 months. They were expecting 5.1%. They got 5.0. So that looks pretty good. Unfortunately, the index for all items, less food and energy, which we would call this core CPI as they strip out food and energy, it actually was a little bit above what the predictions were. And just because of that slight amount that came in, what did the markets do? Well, the crypto markets per se held up pretty well, except for the Bitcoin last 24 hours down 2%, Ethereum was down 1%, BNB 2.5%, and so on and so forth. The traditional markets, S&P 500, uh, took a little bit of a nosedive. And then also the same thing with NASDAQ. I personally uh, understand that uh, the markets are a little bit jumpy, especially after the banks have collapsed and people are afraid of things being broke. But in all honesty, when we take a look at the meetings, I don't think it's worth this type of reaction. Now, I could be wrong. And we've also actually seen that uh, there is information that people are now more relevant and think that there's going to be a Fed rate hike. They're expecting 525, almost 65%. And other people have said, no, 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 about, about a third say, no, no, we're going to keep the same. And Jerome Powell and the Fed are not going to raise rates. Once we go over the Fed minutes, I want you to comment in a section why you think people believe that Jerome Powell is lying and he will not raise rates, even though he keeps saying he will raise rates and he keeps doing it. So this is what happened with the, with the March Fed meeting or FOMC meeting. Here is the breakdown. Recent indicators point to modest growth in spending and production. Unemployment rate has remained low. Inflation remains elevated. Now the Fed does want the employment rate to go higher, which means that inflation will come down because people won't have the money to buy things because they'll be laid off. It is a cruel world and that is what the Fed wants. The committee seeks to achieve maximum employment inflation at the rate of 2% over the long run. I personally don't think they're going to hit that number, but uh, I could be wrong. I'm thinking they'll get to 3% but like, well, good enough. Hopefully they can do that. But this is the interesting part, this word firming. The committee anticipates that some additional policy firming is going to be needed, sufficiently restrictive to return inflation at 2% over time. What this says to me is Jerome has already said this. He said, look, we're going to keep the rates uh, at the same level or higher for longer to get it down to 2%. And that would be a form of firming or staying firm on the policy that, that they set forth. The committee will continue to reduce its holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities or MBSs. And this is what we would call quantitative tightening. And if we take a look here, the Fed was doing pretty good for a number of years, not buying too much or meddling in the market. But then this thing called the coronavirus came about and they started buying up everything. They went from uh, 4.16 trillion of total assets and skyrocketed in a very small amount of time to 7.16, almost double. And then they said, well, we'll back off a little bit. But as time went on in 2020, they kept buying, kept buying, kept buying until they hit their apex of almost 9 trillion or 8.93 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet. And then they realized like, man, we can't keep buying. We're gonna have to do a little tightening. And they did that to offload some of their assets. They did pretty well until they broke the banks. And the banks, they said, well, we need to buy up some of these, some of these assets. And they did, and they increased around 300 billion. Just a 300 billion between friends, not a big deal. And now they're saying that they're going to uh, let off the gas on some of those things. However, the interesting part was they said, we're going to do some tightening, but then we're going to reinvest into MBSs. The number of principal payments from the Federal Reserve's holdings of agency debt and agency MBS received in each calendar month that exceeds a cap of $35 billion per month. So reinvest into 
agency, mortgage-backed securities. Interesting. And then to finish up, I think this is one of the cruxes of it. Inflation persists at a level of well below 2%. Powell explains that Fed expects slow growth and supply demand rebalancing with inflation moving down. That's their goal. Participants of the Fed do not see rate cuts this year. Again, that's in direct opposition of what people are saying. They're like, no, no, no. They're going to keep things at the same rate. And they could, but they're going to keep raising rates. Moving down, this is what I found interesting. Now, this is going to sound a little bit of bearish in the short term, but think about the long term. Here, I'm not really concerned with the day-to-day -day price action. I'm not a big trader, not a scalper. I just look for the long term. And this, to me, is incredibly bullish. Listen to this. Given their assessment of the potential economic effects of the recent banking sector developments, the staff's projection at the time of the March meeting included a mild recession starting later this year, with the recovery over the next two years. Real GDP growth in 2024 was projected to remain below the staff's estimate of potential output growth, and then GDP growth in 2025 was expected to be above that of the potential. Here's what this says to me. This says that, yes, in the short term, we're going to see a little bit more of some bearishness. Maybe a recession comes, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's uh, short term, maybe it's mild, maybe it's severe. But remember that recessions are a natural timeline or cycle of the markets. They last around 10 to 10 and a half months. Then that helps to shake out or reset the inflation that's going on, and it always drops. So if that does happen in Q3, maybe Q4, so much the better. So what happens is that going to destroy us? Well, in the short term, no. In the long term, definitely not. And when it talks about here that these things actually happen, and then in 2024, there's like a little bit of a, of a reset. And in 2025, there's uh, above that a potential for GDP growth. How great would that be? Now, you have to remember that usually what happens is the market rebounds first and then the economy. So they're saying that the economy will rebound in 2025 to a healthy amount or above the GDP growth, that is good news. Why is that good news for 2025? It goes like this, my friends. If you've been watching me for any length of time, you know I'm a big believer in the Bitcoin four-year cycles. So this always happens. It's happened so far. I think it will continue to happen. In 2012, we get a Bitcoin halving. And right after that halving, we get an all-time high. Then we go through a dip and then a little reset. And those dips are pretty harsh. 2016, the same thing happened. There was a halving of Bitcoin. 2017, we had an all-time high. Then we had a dip and a reset. I remember those days. And now we just went through another halving in 2020. In 2021, we had our all-time high. Remember that? Glorious times. And then last year, we went through quite a bit of dip, and now we're going through a little bit of a reset. This, I believe, is a time to accumulate in 2023. That's what I'm doing. I'm not telling you what to do, not financial advice. But what happens in the next two years? 2024, there's a halving, and that is a guarantee. It's going to happen around March or April for Bitcoin. What happens right after that? An all-time high. What is the Fed telling us? Well, they expect GDP growth to be pretty high in 2025. And what does that coincide with? The Bitcoin all-time high. Now, not to say that this is a definite or sure thing, but it is uncanny how things are lining up. Let me know what you think about this in the comments section. I see this as quite bullish, as I've always been, bullish long-term, bearish in the short-term. And then to finish up, and we'll get out of here, the Chappelle upgrade. Ethereum's ability for people to unstake and sell went live today. So just so you know, currently $34 billion or 18 million Ether is locked in the Beacon Chain contract. Validators will be able to withdraw their funds subject to specific thresholds built into the rules such as only 1,800 validator cap per day. What this means, and we talked about this yesterday, the day before that, it's the same thing. It's going to take them weeks to sell their Ethereum if they do sell it. Even yesterday, we took a look at data from Glassnode, and it says that the break-even point is roughly around 2230. And that means that if you're above 2230 or at, then you're in the money. And below that, you are in or out of the money, and you are not profitable. What is the price of Ethereum uh, this morning or today? We are looking at a price of $1,902. So I don't expect a massive sell-off for Ethereum, but I could be wrong. 
but uh, this is what we have. I don't think people, there will still be people who will sell. That is a natural thing. But as far as a massive sell-off and Ethereum going down to a thousand or below, I just don't see that happening. But that's all we have. And that's it for today. So look, this week we are in uh, Los Angeles, California. So you may see the earbuds as well. We're going to have a, uh, an interview with Howard Spaulding from AMP later today. So I'll put that out as fast as possible. But that's it for right now. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. This uh, crypto market is not something that is a set and forget it. It might help you out to be informed of the things that are going on. That's it for today. Well, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.